Well, this this might fly in the face of the prevailing wisdom from Ghostbusters, which is don't cross the streams. Uh, but I was talking to a friend of mine the other day about like how he decides how to mix all this stuff together. Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm chatting with Prescott Perez Fox. For those of you OG listeners to the show, we're trying to remember if this is the fourth or the third. You know, I've been on his show, he's been on my show. You may remember Prescott from hosting the Busy Creator podcast. Prescott is now out in Arizona. He's teaching, he's a homeowner, like all kinds of things have changed. We're excited to catch up with him and chat a little bit more today about what's going on with him. So without further ado, please enjoy this multi-conversation with Prescott Perez Fox. Prescott, hey, it is good to see you, man. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I mean, I'm still alive and yeah. you know, we're, <laughs> it is the year 2020. So that ain't All nothing. bets are off. <laughs> and yeah, right. It, I mean, for Harry Potter fans among us, there's that scene where Ron gets the paper and he, or maybe Hermione gets the paper and Ron sa- like leans over and says, is anyone we know dead? And <laughs> <laughs> I kind of feel like that. It's like, okay, what new chaos has been unleashed? You know, and there's, there was a news article. It's like a meteor is coming. I'm like a literal <laughs> meteor. Come on, folks. <laughs> So, so yeah, I'm still here, man. I'm still above the earth. As if the murder hornets weren't enough. We've got to have yeah, more yours too. Uh, well, just a level set because, uh, you know, we have been stacking up these recordings over the summer of 2020 and it is, we're just barely into September at the moment. So, uh, you know, for whatever meteor thing does come next before we actually release this episode, let's just level set. We're in September. How are things in Arizona? Like what's, what's the, the quarantine COVID situation like right now? Sure. Well, as of early September, there was a, there was a nasty peak in July or something. And we started making international news Mm -hmm. and that finally shamed the, the (laughs) the governor, especially into doing something. Um, so mayors started putting in place mask orders. And then finally, the governor started mandating things like restaurants and gyms and um, inner tube, like river tubing is like a mm-hmm. very specific thing that, that, that sort of fell into my like, river. Tu- oh, okay. But um, from all the lazy rivers. And yeah, I was like, I didn't know that it was such a big deal. I mean, you, you think Arizona, you think they would have like golf courses that, that might that might be enough to get a specific mention. But yeah. apparently river anyway. <laughs> so people are finally wearing a mask is my point, even though it's Wild West culture. People finally figured it out and we've been able to retreat the levels, except now it's back to school and mm, right. every school, university, middle school, high school, whatever is, is its own community. And you are seeing new positive cases. And I don't know how many of those lead to hospitalizations and how many lead to ultimately to deaths, but it, that's a worrying numerical trend. Uh, so we'll see how it plays out. I mean, it's only September and this is kind of the back to school chat. <laughs> yeah, right. So we are actually back to campus at Arizona state university. And that's, it's a little bizarre. Maybe we could just jump right in. If you don't have anything yeah, else. I want to, I totally want to dig into that. Maybe just a level set for our listeners. Um, so people who are new to the show, maybe give them just a little bit of background on you. So before this oh, okay. teaching thing, give them kind of your, uh, your storied past. Sure. Well, like everyone else, I did a degree in mechanical engineering. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Pretty standard. So, yeah. A mechanical engineer turned graphic designer. I, I went to grad school in England and then came back from England and, and worked in New York for like 13 years. And my focus, like, like yours really, is brand design, communication design, packaging. And so a little more of the, I guess, relatively analog compared to what's popular now. Yeah, right. Um, I did that for a long time in New York and I love it and love the field and the people I met. Um, but I got to a point in 2018 where I was, I mean, I was looking for a change. I was looking to leave New York in general. And then this opportunity came up. I found it. It found me in Arizona where not only am I changing locations to Phoenix and to a completely different side of the country, but also changing from a practitioner role to a full-time teaching role. And, uh, 
came out here for the interview, you know, still was open minded. I wasn't like, I have to get that job and move. Like I was I kind of didn't know what it, what it was. Yeah. Um, and it, and it all worked out, you know? So they, they gave me the offer and I moved out within like three weeks and, and came over here, started over, you know, 37 years old and basically was like sleeping on an air mattress, like while all my stuff was in a shipping container. And <laughs> I, <laughs> it's, it's definitely very humbling. It felt like, you know, it felt like being 22 again and, and going yeah. to a university, it felt like I was a freshman again, like seeing this new exotic, like literally otherworldly sort of environment. Uh, and then all these, you know, happy people and there's a nice gym and there's like fountains and shit It's landscaped, you know? And I'm like, Whoa, this is, this is reawakening. So in some ways I think it was, it was quite due The putting in your time in New York really grinds you down. For those of us who didn't grow up in New York, to go experience what New York is, is like this eye opening, like, wow, this is New York. This is, this is wild. It's amazing to see this. And then it's interesting to hear you having like the opposite experience of like, oh, this is the not yet New York. <laughs> this is, this is what life is outside of, of that. And to see, you know, wide open spaces and that's yeah. kind of hilarious. Well, I, totally. And New York is so interesting, right? Because let me tell you, right until the day I left, there's still those moments of wonder in New York. Mm. And I would catch myself just walking, whatever. I'm on Houston street. I don't know. And I just say to myself, my God, it's 21st century. I live in New York city, you know, and there's like new buildings going up and new shows opening and new restaurants and all types of madness. And it, it, it is kind of an infinity of stimulation. Uh, even when it's down, even when there's a recession or a pandemic, but you know, I think that if you look, if you take the long arc view, the, the kind of reasonable middle-class things, that, you, that you're hunting, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's becoming harder and harder and harder just to get up in the morning in New York. And I'm not the only one that, that has that opinion. Um, right. So you could, you could sort of sum it up and, you know, I haven't lived there in a while, so you have to update me, but I think it's still the case that it, to, to put it in like very succinct terms, the subway's broken and I can't afford rent. Mm -hmm. And why the hell would you live in a place that you can't afford rent and you can't get anywhere? Right. For, I shouldn't say maybe not, live there once, but like live there for 15 years, you know, it's yeah, like, right. All right, enough is enough. <laughs> well, our uh, thoughts are definitely with all the New York residents. We've had a lot of New Yorkers on the show here recently, sort of coincidentally back to back to back. You're one of the few who's not in New York while I'm talking to you. Um, but man, yeah, it's especially challenging right now. So even before COVID tough enough, but you know, super tough now, but so catch us up. Um, You've been teaching for a little over two years now. Sure. Did you ever think this was something that you wanted to get into eventually? Like, did you see yourself in a teaching role? Um, kind of, you know, that I know it's a hedge, but I did a master's degree. And one of the, I, I don't know, first things they tell you about master's is like, well, if you want to teach, it's always there. You know, it's that a lot of places have that requirement. Mm -hmm. And I mean, some, some schools, I think still do that sort of thing where if you're an industry practitioner and you have kind of 25 years experience that can still sneak you in. But a lot, a lot of places are actually still very stubborn about that. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, that's a tough conversation because you actually see the industry going, reversing its trend, or, you know, that you're actually seeing the words degree required being removed. And then you come to a university and it's like, listen, the people who are on the cutting edge of, of like UX design which is only a field that's like six years old. They don't have master's degrees. They, they've been building websites since the, the Clinton administration. <laughs> right. That's so, a good point. Yes, I am in, I'm in my third academic year now and it goes quick, but at the same time, like a lot has happened. And I mean, universities are so odd and you learn so much about the job and the system. Um, I had taught previously. I, I I taught at city college or city tech in Brooklyn with Douglas mm -hmm. Davis. And that was just one class, but it was, you know, it was an experience in being a whatever 30 something practitioner and then facing a room of these kind of wide eyed students who are, who are still very optimistic and, and, and also just don't know about the field because they haven't been out there. Um, so I had that experience. And so it didn't seem unreasonable. Like it wasn't like, mm -hmm. Oh my God, what am I going to do? I guess I'll teach. I've never set foot in a classroom, <laughs> you know, that type of thing. Um, and also strangely enough, I think that as a podcaster, 
I sort of had a, a preparation for being in front of the room and being on the mic and, and just developing my speaking voice a little bit mm-hmm. as well as um, being, or sorry, as organizing the New York city podcast meetup, which I did for, I guess it was oh, right. about 18 months. Um, that was a funny experience because long story short, we didn't get huge traction, right? It was a small group, but being in front of that room, like month after month, uh, it took some warming up. I, I hadn't really done a lot of speaking. Mm-hmm. And then, next thing you know, if, even if it's like 20 people, they're all kind of just trained at you. And they're like, wait, you're the expert. I'm like, I'm not the expert. I just, I'm just the one that ordered the pizza. Like <laughs> there's nothing going, you know what I'm saying? But that, that really made me comfortable in the room. And I think at a fundamental level, I like being in the room. And honestly, not every teacher can say that. Not every university professor and even down to like middle school and stuff like there's a lot of people that become teachers just because it's, it's an option. So sort mm-hmm. of every zip code in America, right? You have teachers and realtors and those are the only jobs that are truly universal. But so I do like, I like being in the room. I'm assuming you wrapped up last semester in the spring with everybody virtual, right? Yeah. Are you, are was, you guys all still virtual this fall? Like, are, is anybody in classroom? Are you going into the labs? Like what, what's it look like on campus right now? Sure. Well, first thing first, it was, as you say, we did get sent home last year, last spring, and we, it was during spring break. So when we're supposed to be kind of chilling and relaxing, it, it's like five days of emergency phone calls. I'm mm-hmm. like, thank you. This is my vacation. <laughs> but we, we um, changed to fully virtual and the, I don't know, the good thing, I guess you could say, is that we were all in the same boat, teachers and students, so, and administrators and everyone else. So we had to reinvent our classes, like in a hurry, yeah. and almost to the point where we said, okay, what I was planning to do literally on Monday, I can't do anymore because it's a, it's a very in-person thing where it's like, everybody bring your project, put it on the table, get the red pen and like, yeah, you can't do out, that. Hang it on the wall. Yeah. You can't do some of that stuff. You have to, you have to reimagine what it is. And so it took a little while to find our zoom sea legs. <laughs> um, and then this semester, our school is actually doing a hybrid. So the campus is open and most classes are a combination of in-person and what they call sync, which is zoom, you know? Mm-hmm. So for us, we are, you know, we're in the front of the room wearing a, in my case, a plastic face shield. And then students are in the room spaced out social distancing, wearing usually cloth masks. Mm -hmm. And then simultaneously, I have to look to the camera and say, thank you everyone for joining us on zoom. And there's, you know, times two watching on zoom. And so we have to now almost like simulcast our, our events. Mm -hmm. And, um, in one of my classes, I have a teaching assistant in the room with me which is very helpful because she can sort of troubleshoot the audio and read the chat and everything. And in the other one, I have a, a TA who is an online student. So she's based in Chicago and wouldn't be there anyway. Um, so it is, it's very much like conducting this virtual class, but actually we're also in, in the room and in the campus. So it's, it's a little disorienting. I gotta be honest. Are there elements of that in-person experience that are difficult to make sure that your online audience is is getting what's going on. Like are, are there moments where there it's not just lecture and you know, you're trying yeah. to circle up and look at something together and ha- like, how do you facilitate that? Sure. Well, it's, it's challenging, right? Because there are times I think when you're in, in person, you can sort of walk, especially in the previous non COVID times where you don't, you're allowed to go within six feet of another person. You can sort of walk up and down the aisles and like tap someone on the shoulder, even if they didn't raise their hand and be like, what do you think? You know, mm-hmm. And to do that on Zoom, you have to be like, let's see. And you scroll down and you say, oh, Jeremy, you want to unmute yourself and contribute? A, a, you know, everything takes longer. Everything's a little more um, prescribed. And, you know, it, in fact, I don't, have the, I don't have the problem yet of people talking over each other. I have the opposite problem where I'm like, okay, are you here? Turn on your camera. Is that a real person? Like, what's happening? Mm-hmm. And, you know, someone won't update their username in, in Zoom. So it's just like JMI. Two two one, and I'm like, is that Josh Miles? Is a J and you know, that type of thing. So it's it's convoluted, and I'm looking forward as the semester unfolds to doing some Zoom specific activities, and where I can say, okay, yes, the campus is open, but I'm going to be on a laptop, so you might as well stay home as well. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and we'll do things with breakout rooms and maybe like miniature presentations. So that if they have their partners, they can say like, okay, you, your partnership is assigned this and you're going to, you're going to unmute yourself and present it to the class, you know, that type of thing. So it is absolutely a challenge and the old rules are just out the window. Um, but at the same time, we definitely do a lot of, of like, holding up your paper to the camera, you know, which seems a little bootleg. It's like, Hey, can you see that? Can you see? <laughs> like, there's a lot of that sort of thing going on. Um, because I don't know, the alternative is such a technological struggle, you know, say, Hey, okay, everyone get the whiteboard and then click share and I'll approve you. And then you will like, you can't do that for 40 people in quick succession. Yeah. It's just like, Hey, hold up your paper, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes that's all you need really. Yeah, that, that's definitely a feature that it feels like they could create less friction for is to yeah. quickly show someone something on my screen without it taking 30 seconds of, well, wait, do you have to make me the host to show the thing? Yeah, or can exactly. I show my screen? Like, how do we, how do I just send everyone the image or can I post the image? It's just, yeah, it's way well, more complicated than it should be. Totally. And that's not even a Zoom problem, right? Because um, you know, remote teams, especially design teams and programmers and whatever, they've, we're not completely new to this. And um, I've worked in remote teams before. And that was a, one of the first things I noticed is that everything has to be a little slower and a little more purposeful. If you want to share a sketch with someone, you have to photograph it, zap it from your phone to your computer, save it into Google Drive, then give people the link and and make sure they can see it like it is multiple steps as opposed to in an <laughs> office where you literally say hey yo and just hold it up like, you don't even have to say their name you're just like right mm, eh, eh, eh. there's just a lot of this some winking and nudging. And... <laughs> look at yeah. my screen <laughs> yeah no totally yeah that that whole thing where, where i mean that's controversial about whether or not you know you should have like the hovering art director behind you <laughs> right. but you don't have the option when you're online so everything has to be more purposeful and it's almost I mean, maybe a little more formal too. Like you can imagine if you have a, you know, a junior designer reporting to you, you could say, Hey, let's check in rather than saying, I'll see you after lunch. I'll just come over to your desk. You say, I'm going to give you more time. Let's check in before six o'clock. So, you know, before the mm -hmm. end of the day. And then that person almost has to put together a multi-page PDF because you don't want to lose that interpretation and that, that sort of margin of error. So things are changing. I can't really say if they're better or worse just yet mm -hmm. um but i think most college professors not all of them i think most of us like a little bit of an old school experience mm -hmm. we want to be in the room we want to learn people's names and and sort of i don't want to say become friends with them but you know create that vibe create that mentoring relationship and as soon as you bring technology into it and as, as soon as you start um, displacing and and sort of stripping away that experience um it, it is concessions. It is a little bit of a second rate experience, but it also opens advantages. So, I mean, number one, you can have people join the class from anywhere. Mm -hmm. So, right. You were a guest in my class as a, as a call, as a guest, All right. guest video. Um, but you could do that every day, you know, and, and you can imagine too, uh, especially a top flight school that really wants to go out and find students and faculty. They could find them from anywhere. You could have people in Japan and South Korea. I don't know. Just They're just part of the class. You wouldn't even know. They're just another rectangle on the screen. Right. And so it opens up some new possibilities for sure. I know a friend of mine who's in, uh, he's a middle school teacher shared that, that his first day of school this year was the weirdest and maybe worst first day of school he's ever had because he was just, you know, it just feels so robotic that everybody's got to stay apart and then all the students have to clean their own desk before they leave. And, you know, he only gets to see them here. He's like, I'll, I'll when I would see other faces pass in the hall, even just seeing this, I, I could recognize some of my former students, yeah. but the ones who are in the room, I may never see them without the mask. He's like, I'm, I may never really get to know them. Like I may never be at the point where when I see them two years from now, I, I'll even know them as one of my students. Cause who knows if I'll even recognize who they are, which is, just really wild. Do you, do you think this, this like additional thrust into virtual, do you think that's going to, even when we are uh, presumably free and clear from COVID risk in the future, whatever, whatever the risk is, if there's not a health concern, do you think this is going to influence the future of school? So like you're saying with, 
you know, you could have somebody from South Korea who's there virtually. Do you, do you think that's going to be uh, kind of a new permanent fixture that you'll be teaching this, this hybrid class? Uh, well, not the hybrid. Um, my firsthand experience is that hybrid is, is not working, <laughs> frankly. And I don't care if my bosses are listening. <laughs> like, I'll tell them, like, this is a disaster. But we've now opened up a third stream, right? And it's, mm-hmm. it's divergence. That first we had the in-person experience. And I mean, that's, that's medieval, right? It's, it's, it's the cathedral experience. <laughs> right. And then we had online. And I guess you could trace that back to the mid nineties, but it, 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 the online education is basically correspondence, right? It's time shifted. There are no live requirements. You don't have to tune in at an appointed hour. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of cases, um, I mean, you might have some partner projects, but generally speaking, the students don't have to talk to any other students and they, that's kind of, that's kind of a feature, not a bug. So, right. If you're on a missile base in South Dakota, you're not worried about what some 19 year olds are doing on spring break. You're just doing the assignment. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so that's online. And now we're opening up this third stream, which is, I guess you could call it virtual or synchronous or whatever. And, but each one is different. So each format requires uh, an instructor who wants to embrace that format. And it requires lessons and assignments that, that take advantage of it. And it also, I think, requires the sort of student who wants to go through that, right? And I mean, just for example, I was a person, I still am, I learned very well in the lecture format. Mm-hmm. And, and like, I love documentaries, I love conferences. Those are all kind of the spinoffs of the same thing, even podcasts. And I retain information very well, almost verbatim from watching a talk or a speech or whatever. Other people cannot stand that. They go to sleep within 30 seconds. They just say, whatever, I need to read the book. And I, I, I hate reading the book. Are you kidding me? So that's, we have those different styles. And I think finally, you know, the 21st century, people are finally starting to embrace that. Like administrators and teachers are finally starting to understand that not everyone is the same. Uh, big revelation. <laughs> Shocker. <right? And> so, <laughs> Who saw that coming? So I think to wedge someone into the wrong uh, format my, my school likes to call them the modalities. And I just refuse mm-hmm. to say that, you right. know, it's unbelievable. They invent like a 13 word phrase just to me, like, Oh, you mean regular classes? Yeah. Okay. Like, <laughs> um, I think to wedge someone into the wrong format would be disastrous and yeah. it's going to happen if it hasn't already, you know, you're going to have someone who um, like, for example, they'll go through three years of conventional face-to-face lecture based education. And then the global pandemic sends them home and suddenly they realize, Oh my God, this is a whole different thing. This is much, much better for me. Mm -hmm. For example, I'm sure that's already happened. Uh, So what if the opposite is true that someone, someone lives in a remote area, they're so used to correspondence education and then they get a chance for one semester to go in person and they, they sort of awaken all these new parts of themselves. Like Mm. that's, that's the opposite case too. So I think it'll be new, but not hybrid. I think it'll be an entirely new thing. Okay. That's interesting. What, are you hearing anything in particular from the students that's surprised you in terms of their acceptance of this new thing or their desire for little tweaks or they're asking for, you know, I just need this one exception or like, what are, what are the students saying? What are they asking for? Yeah. Interesting. Well, so far, and again, it's been you know, kind of eight weeks in the spring. And then now it's another two weeks in the fall. Um, most of the talk has been logistical, which is a little bit superficial, I guess you could say. So some people have problems with wireless access or, or mm. I mean, you know, internet access, but they say, okay, a sl- slow Wi-Fi at my house, or I have a lot of family members. I don't have a private space to, to record, to attend classes. So even though you say, mom, I'm in class, like there's still no boundaries in the home. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, some people don't have computers. And so like our library has a system of, of long-term loaning computers, which is, you know, really nice. Um, cause not everyone has those resources, you know, like Arizona, I mean, quick sidebar, the, the Navajo nation is largely in Arizona and it's extremely impoverished compared to the average North American university student. So to be like, oh yeah, just go home and attend class. They'll be like, dude, we don't, we have to walk six miles to get dial up internet. Like, what are you talking yeah. about? 
And uh, so things like that are absolutely on everyone's mind. Um, a lot of students have kind of superficially said, oh, it's the same. And I'm like, are you <laughs> kidding me? Like they, they, I guess they don't appreciate the in-person vibe, but they can, it's more convenient. Maybe they're just for them. roll with it. You know, they're just yeah. the, like, yeah, that's fine. I'm, I, that's, uh, that maybe is the shocking thing is how nonchalant I would say most people are. And I mean, yes, there are immediate pluses and uh, that you can see, like you could say, all right, you don't have to pay for parking. You don't have to commute. You don't have to get your clothes dry cleaned. Like those are all absolutely apparent. Um, if you have childcare, same thing. You'd be like, my kid is in the next room. I don't have to drop him anywhere. Mm-hmm. I don't have to do this morning scramble. Right. Um, but ultimately I think those are quite superficial compared to this, this big concept of like, did you learn anything for four years? Are you prepared for your future profession? Uh, you say, well, no, but I also didn't spend money on dry cleaning. Like, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my, um, my youngest is eight years old and we just had this virtual meet the teacher, which was kind of a joke because I, I know this teacher cause he's been in the same school system for a while. And, um, so meet the teacher was just like a 10 minute powwow of like how he's doing. And <clears throat> I had asked about like, is he doing okay? Is he listening? And, and his teacher was like, oh yeah, he's just super chill and roll with it. And it's like, it's like nothing has changed. And, you know, the reality is very, like the majority of things have changed. They're, right. they're spread out, they're in face shields, they're in like all of this, all of these things are different. But like at age eight, he's still, this is just a blip for him. Like it's, it's not a big deal. Um, <clears throat> so it, it's wild to think about that. And it's, it's also interesting to think about even, even college students at this point, like maybe this is, they're just going to be that flexible, you know, kind of defining what, what Gen Z or whatever generation my son's supposed to be at this point. Like, (laughs) you know, maybe, maybe this, you know, harsh change and wild back and forth, um, you know, maybe that's going to kind of influence what we, what we have to say about that generation here in the future. Yeah. Really interesting. It's very hard to time travel (laughs) and predict what's, what's going to happen. Um, I've sort of joked that some of the students, I won't say all of them, of course, Mm -hmm. but some of them, you can see their motivation. They want to stay home, play video games, and still somehow magically get an A. And this Zoom learning, this remote thing, it's you're kind of giving them two out of the three if if you count Zoom (laughs) as a video game. (laughs) And then and then they get mad that they still have to do the assignment. I'm like, oh my God, I'm practically giving you what you want here. So um that's actually one thing, uh, maybe it's a little off topic. Uh, you know what? Let me, let me answer your question. <laughs> so my prediction about the future, about how it's going to change education, mm-hmm. I think you're going to see more options and more permutations uh, that involve time off, that involve homeschooling, that involve clusters. I don't know what you want to call it. Like, right? Think mm-hmm. about this, this concept of the charter school but on a micro level. So rather than a big building with a principal, it's just like Dave and Dave's kids, as well as my kids, you know, it's like micro school that Mm -hmm. you've, you've mixed germs because you're already like best family friends. But now you say, Oh, we got two kids in middle school. Let's, let's put them together in the garage. And so, I mean, that sounds very DIY, but you know what? Families are living together in, in multiple generations now. And you have a lot of grandparents who are helping with homeschooling. And, and, you know, think, I think about my parents, my mother's retired teacher. I'm sure she would love to, to help school my nephews. Um, and, and actually she's on the older end, you know, you could be retired and, and be 55 mm-hmm. and you say, I got plenty. I could teach one kid after doing it for 30 years. That's <laughs> nothing. And you know what I mean? Uh, so things like that are going to change. And especially, um, if you see folks leaving cities, um, maybe they lost their job, but maybe they're just sick of the cities. And so you have a multi-generational uh, suburban situation with technology and it's going to change a lot of things. Yeah. I think especially when the content or curriculum is being delivered by a trusted source. So you, the, as the instructor, it's not your job to come up with all the things that they need to learn and what the plan is and, you know, how often to teach what, but the, the basic outline of the content is already provided. I think at that point, then it, that micro learning environment gets, gets really interesting. It's almost like the old, 
you know, pioneer schoolhouses with, with 12 kids, you know, yeah. total <laughs> and one, one schoolmaster at the front of the room teaching everybody the same stuff. So, um, this could get, could get really interesting and really yeah. weird, like all at the same that, time. That always puzzled me, actually. I mean, that's, that's a very specific thing that I pondered. It's like, <laughs> how can you have a kid that's 14 years old and a kid that's six in the same like school room? And I don't know, I don't know if there's like records about it, but yes, you can always like improve your handwriting, but <laughs> is it, is it the, the kind of, it's almost like graduate school where the, the, the teacher is more like the, the tutor, the mentor, where you just kind of give people topics to pursue and then mm. they come back with the, with the, whatever they learned. So, I mean, that's a very different model of teaching than being like module one, lesson two, this, you will have a test November 8th. And mm -hmm. I mean, that's frankly what happens with, especially public education with the uh, standardized tests and with the grades. And like, I don't even want to wade into that sort of cesspool. Um, <laughs> my new thing, I hate to like talk about my new thing, but it's, it's defund middle school. So it's <laughs> hashtag defund middle school. And basically my, my great um, PhD thesis here is that middle school is terrible and it, it scars us all, right? Talk to anyone that's been in therapy and mm -hmm. basically you trace it back to middle school. Right. And, you know, you're right. Yeah. And religious scholars will say, you know, about like Buddhism, it's like the source of all human suffering is like middle school. Like, yeah. Well, actually, but <laughs> it's gotta be in the uh, top three. It's terrible. And we, we are so gruesome to one another at that age. And may, you know, maybe it's an American thing. I don't know. But what if you remixed just those three or four years? And those were the years of the, almost like the Danish far school where you went on these big adventures and you learned skills and, oh, this guy's interested in trees. All right, go to Wisconsin and like poke around. This guy's interested in animals. Well, like go work in a zoo three days a week. You know, that would be very interesting. And, and I wonder if you, Okay, you learned how to read and write a little bit in elementary school. Now you leave for a while. And when you're reunited as teenagers, it's a whole different system. Mm -hmm. So Nick's middle school is my, <laughs> my goal. And also think about anyone running an agency. Wouldn't it be interesting to have like a 12-year-old helping out to like fix a photocopier? You didn't have to do that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I would be especially interested... I know we have quite a few international listeners and fans. Uh, so middle school is like what, 11, 12, 13, 14, somewhere in years old, somewhere in yeah. those age ranges. So I don't know what they call it in every other country or system, but um, let us know like in whatever platform you're on, tweet to at it, Obsessed Joe, or go to YouTube and put this in the comments or go to the website, obsessedjoe.com and fill in the contact form. Like I, in all seriousness is is that age band where kids are most cruel to one another in where you are locally. So outside of the U S fill us in, this will be an enlightening and maybe disappointing <laughs> thing sure. to hear about. And it's so funny too, not to keep, you know, belaboring the point, but like that you, we would, we just watched the um, Michael Jordan documentary. Did you watch mm -hmm. that one? The last yeah, dance. That's so good. So, and here's the funny thing I'm watching. That, I mean, that is time travel, you know, because it's like, boom, 25 years instantly. And I haven't really watched that much basketball since mm -hmm. that was an era where the, you know, the middle school brain is not designed for academic learning. It's designed for memorizing sports stats and for learning the violin and for training in soccer and whatever else, like things you learn, you pick up very well, things you're passionate about, but mm -hmm. things that people make you do, it's, it's just awful. You know, you think, okay, what did I learn in middle school? Julius Caesar, and you can use a dot to mean multiplication. Like it's, it, it, the, it's almost a blur academically, but you remember mm -hmm. all the, all the championship games and you, anyway. Um, all the hormones that are rushing through and in and out. And it's just, it's oh, yeah, so, that too. Well, so well that's the funny thing that that's a time in our lives. I swear this is coming to a conclusion where we are trying to establish ourselves as people but also mm -hmm. defining our interests in music, in film and sports, in, you know, maybe in books and you're, you're creating your personality and it's just constant competition. So it's competition for, for wittiness and for worldliness and for athletic prowess. Right. And someone grows six inches and suddenly they're dominant on the basketball court. 
And then, you know, this guy is overweight and this girl doesn't get wear a bra and like, it's just awful. Yeah. So maybe we should be a little more isolated during that. <laughs> <laughs> but man, watching the last dance, I mean, first of all, uh, I, I think there are a lot of interesting things from a design and production perspective in that documentary and the way that they kind of Tarantino back and forth between like the, the present day of this last season and going back to season one or season four or season three yeah, yeah. Um, and working in the shoes and the Nike stuff and then all of the drama off the court. But um, when they would show that game footage in the same way, like, like I remember that game. Like I, I watched that game. That's, uh, Oh, I remember what happened. I remember how frustrated I was when they lost or, um, man, it yeah, just kind of brought back all of those emotions. It was wild. I know. And it, I think what's amazing too, yeah, at the same point is that you, I remember watching those games at, you know, being 12, 13, whatever. And those guys seemed so old and so sort of dashing and they mm -hmm. were in their late twenties, early thirties. Right. And I see them now and, and they're like, they're younger than me, even, you know, Clyde Drexler, who was like an old guy, he was half bald. It was like yeah. 31, you know, <laughs> it's like, oh, geez, it's, it's weird how we idolize them all, you know? Um, but so that's funny too. And I, I haven't seen Michael Jordan. I mean, I guess maybe Michael Jordan is one person you have seen his photo, mm -hmm. but all these other guys, John Paxson or whatever, I have not seen that guy in 25 right. years. Yeah. So then you're just like, whoa, what's happening here? Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a very curious sort of documentary to watch. And I suppose every industry kind of has its, its own, like if you did one about politics, and you say, oh, I haven't seen that guy's chief of staff in whatever years. Um, it's the same type of thing. But yeah, no, totally. Interesting way of time traveling and storytelling. And my only criticism of that is that they didn't show the entire chapter of Jordan's return and the number 45 jersey. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, uh, that's weird that you didn't mention that. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I guess that was after the... Yeah, it was a blip. Like there was a, there was a short scene about that, but it was not a long, a long thing. Yeah. But I thought, I mean, they showed his retirement, but then they didn't, they didn't give as much prominence to the fact that he unretired. They mm -hmm. just, it just kind of was like, oh, he's back. And right. I was like, but like the, the 40, like they sold a lot of 45 jerseys to school kids. I think it would have been, it didn't, I don't think the 45 appeared on screen. I'll have to, I guess I'll have to watch it again. And uh, that's my only criticism. I thought it was really interesting. And then of course, Michael Jordan's kids are on screen for like one second each I was like, that's uh, the editor forgot that they had to be in there. Right. Yeah. There, there was not a whole lot of the personal family life for, for MJ, which was from my recollection as a fan um, was also kind of how the public eye was too. Like you just didn't see a whole lot into his family. There are certain athletes that like their family is part of their story on the field. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and probably more than not, you don't see the families necessarily unless they're a big standout athletes, even like when Peyton Manning was here in Indianapolis, like you didn't hear about his, his family or his wife or any of these things nearly as much as you do with some other public figures. So I think some athletes are just really good at, or very intentional about keeping the, the family yeah. life very private. That was and off, a, that's off a funny error too. Maybe there's a transition here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Those guys, it wasn't just my imagination. They wore suits it was a whole different level of professionalism. You know, maybe you could call it kind of mock formality. Like why, why do basketball players need to wear suits? That is a question worth examining. But even when I was in college in the early 2000s, I remember Allen Iverson was the, the big transition, I guess you, mm -hmm. right? Where he was so casual. He had cornrows and tons of tattoos. And, and he really, I guess, kind of broke the seal on, on that culture. Um, and I was like, wait a minute shouldn't these guys be wearing suits? They make millions of dollars. They're in the public eye. They represent a large organization. Like what's going on here? And then watching the documentary, they literally are all wearing suits and they talk about it. And the guy said, I I'm not planning to, you know, Michael Jordan, I think he said, I'm not planning to lose. In fact, I only brought one suit. And, yeah. and you know, Josh and I are like, we only have one suit. <laughs> you know, like I wear that for a week string of conferences and weddings. It's like, I only have one suit. What do you want from me? But anyway, <laughs> sidebar. So I think a lot of industries are becoming more casual. And that, that goes back to this idea of remote work mm -hmm. and telecommuting and et cetera. Um, but it, it's just interesting to, you know, to, to see something that wasn't that old, but it's still enough evidence of it that you can paint that picture. 
So speaking of formality and in quarantine, uh, I have kind of gone the Steve Jobs route of, uh, you know, almost always in a plain T-shirt, occasionally a hat and jeans like like that's my uniform. It's just I have lots of other clothes that I don't wear at this point because it's just it's taken the the decision fatigue away to just say, OK, which which plain shirt am I going to wear? In fact, I have a whole bunch of the same black and a whole bunch of the same white V-neck shirt. So like mm. the go-to is a black or white V-neck and occasionally like you get this kind of in between purpley color today, but um, it's a lot of the same thing. So I was on a call yesterday where I was kind of hosting a group and um, it didn't even occur to me until right before the camera turned on. I was like, should I wear something else? And then I was like, <laughs> nah, everybody else is casual. Like, and, and it just occurred to me, like, I wonder if anybody was bothered that like I was hosting this thing in a t-shirt, like, is that, is, is everybody past that at this point? Or are there still people that are, that are holding on to the, like, this is a formal thing and you should look like, this is a businessy kind of call. Yeah. So I don't know the answer to that. What, what do you think? What well, do you do for school? I, I actually tell my students that zoom is the classroom. And so you have to arrive with a certain amount of respect for your fellow classmates and for the professor and for just the concept of school, like, right. Mm -hmm. And so in, in real life, that means don't come in pajamas with a mustard stain down the front. Like it, that <laughs> I don't really care, like from a, you know, fabric point of view, what you're wearing, but if it looks ridiculous, if it looks like you don't care about your appearance, if, like th now we got a problem. So it's the same thing in zoom. And I mean, you could see you and I both have a nice video setup where we, we put the lighting on our face and mm -hmm. we we test our microphone to make sure we can be heard. And it's kind of a respect for the other person. So, the, and you know, I love to, to talk about your t-shirt point. I have gotten in the habit of wearing black t-shirts when I record video because, um, first of all, there's less distraction, but also it kind of absorbs the light and doesn't make me look like I have weird chins and that sort of thing. Um, and also when I record, record videos for classes, which I now do like recording and editing conversations. And I'm like, basically I've, I've gone from professor to YouTuber overnight. You know, when I, when I end a class, I actually say kind of that subscribe <laughs> button, but, <Right. laughs> oh, geez. but in the videos, you know, someone else watching the videos in a future semester might be watching them in, in rapid succession. And so they're going to see that consistency. Yeah. And that, that so I think in case is, they want to binge on you. They're going to get oh, the God, same. Geez. The same well, character. Yeah. So I think it's less about, you know, whether or not you have a collar or whether or not you're, you're wearing jeans versus slacks or khakis and more about how much um, respect did you put into the, the whole operation. Mm. And when someone, I, you know, my, my old, uh, my old Ed stamp, I don't know what to call this, like my old cliche about when you send someone an email, it has to be short enough that they can read it on a mobile phone and not be like, Oh my God, what is this? I'm not reading this. But then it also, you have to realize that people are reading it on the go. And so you have to be like really short, you know, and people are like, they'll open your PDF, your portfolio or whatever. And, and they're in the Minneapolis airport. And it's like, you got to think about what situation they're in. But at the same time, I think if you're a creative director, if you're an agency boss or something, and you're doing really important work, like you owe it to the person not to read your phone while you're in line at the airport, like sit down and actually take the time. And I mean, you know, I'm not going to cure the entire industry overnight, but it's that, that idea of the medium is the medium, but there's a certain amount of respect that goes into it. Mm -hmm. Sort of the requirement of the focus that if you're going to look at it on a screen, that's smaller than your hand, then, then maybe get somewhere where you can give it the attention it deserves and, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a super unique challenge that it's, it's not just that we're occasionally dealing with that. It's more like we're, we're constantly dealing with that at this point, but everyone is, nobody is at their office. <laughs> Nobody's right. You know, in the, in the same situation that they used to be on a regular basis. So, um, yeah, yeah. There's there's a, a shared suffering that is helping the situation. <laughs> so I mean, you know, I've got a faculty call coming up, and even our director, who has a hundred plus people reporting to her, sometimes she's at her school office, sometimes she's in her living room, and right, it's, I mean, we're we're sort of okay with that. 
Um, but I tell you, she's going to be in a clean shirt. You know what I mean? Like yeah. she's not going to be wearing a, a suit, you know, but that's okay. And um, a lot of people are pretty informal at our school as well. And I don't, I don't know how many of the fellows wear a tie. Very few. Yeah. It, I mean, we're not wearing like Adidas track suits either, but it is, I guess you could say it's business casual. Like everything is business casual now. It's, it's just kind of like, uh, I don't know. I like to say, I don't use the casual uh, scale. I -hmm. basically say dressed for blank. So you're dressed for bed, dressed for the gym, dressed for the world or dressed for a funeral. And there's, Mm -hmm. there's kind of a big gap there between the world and like the gym. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Called athleisure, I think. (laughs) I I suppose so. Well, you know, I saw this even when I was working in New York, like especially in some of the ad agencies and some that were like fashion focused that mm-hmm. you could wear jeans, but they would, they would have to be high priced, you know, right. denim, uh, what do you call Dick diesel jeans? You know, they, they're sort of like fancy enough to be informal, but if you paired that with sneakers and a blazer, so you're, you're like it balancing the formality in different garments and themselves. Mm-hmm. And you, does that make sense? It's a, it's a funny thing that, and like, for example, here's a classic one that for gentlemen, anyway, if you don't shave, normally you'd be like, oh my God, this guy didn't shave two, three days. He's looking a bit rough. But if you pair that with a crisp collared shirt, it almost offsets it. And maybe because mm-hmm. it's only like an inch away, but that's one that, that immediately jumps to mind. So if you do go with a, a crew neck, like a t-shirt or a, a sweater, mm-hmm. um, then you have to sort of shave and you, you have to make sure your glasses don't have tape in the middle or whatever it is. <laughs> so you're sort of balancing the formal and informal elements with each other. Yeah, totally. So maybe going back to the school thing for a second, um, sure. are your students worried about what the job market is going to hold for them in the spring? Yeah. Good question. I mean, they should be. Yeah. I, so I teach senior portfolio class and that I rewrote that class almost from the ground up based on my experiences. And Mm -hmm. I keep it real. You know, I tell them, I say, this is the class I did not have not only in, in my bachelor's degree, I didn't have it in grad school. This is 10 plus years of hard lessons of getting kicked in the teeth of getting insulted and brutalized and, and the, the absolute lowest point of my life where I was facing a period of unemployment, like these are the lessons. Like, please, for, I don't know, in the yeah. sake of everything that is holy, like, just watch the video. <laughs> you don't even have to right. live my life. Um, and so I, I created that class very purposefully so that they are, are as prepared as possible for what's to come. Um, it's not a complete job hunting class. I mean, you could do that. You, you mm-hmm. know, you could have a kind of job hunt lab that meets twice a week for an entire semester. Absolutely. Um, it's a portfolio class. So they have to essentially design a personal brand, build a portfolio website, and then create these job search materials, like a, a resume and cover letter format. And um, the ones who do it well have a, a really sharp execution. And most of them do find work within a couple of weeks. Um, there are others that I don't even hear from, you know, there, I mean, mm-hmm. there are folks in our program that I don't think even try to enter the profession. I'm not sure really what they do, but um, there is a long sort of a long curve, a long distribution. And some people are absolutely ahead of the game and some people are, are very much behind it. So it's hard to say though, what's going to happen because I think a lot of business is still ongoing right. and they they have remote employees and maybe their, maybe their, their role is changing. You know, it's less about obviously like in-person events are not really a thing. So they're mm-hmm. leaning more into, into book sales and newsletters. I don't, I'm just making something up, but right. there are people, it's, it's very odd now, especially for folks like you and me, that you could go through the entire recruitment process, right? Phone calls, interviews, offer, and first day, and, and it's all remote. And that's, it's not unprecedented, but it's generally pretty new. Are you getting any feeling for um, maybe folks coming out of school, students who are the highest demand or recent grads are in the highest demand, whether they are more narrowly focused or if they are more broadly 
like decent at lots of things. What, what are you hearing from the students or are you seeing anything from the job market itself? Mm, yeah. Interesting. Um, you know, I'm, I should pay more attention, honestly, because our program, it's called graphic information technology, which doesn't really help, but it's kind of an omnibus design <laughs> program sure. in an engineering school. Mm -hmm. So it's, it started as the commercial printing major in the mm -hmm. 1950s. And now we still have print and digital design as a focus area, as a track, but we also have front end web design, 3D animation, uh, commercial photography and video. And so the core curriculum is a little bit of everything. So everyone that graduates has to take a video class and mm -hmm. a studio photography class and a print class, right? And even in my class, the portfolio, it is their strategy. There's logo design, which is essentially, you know, 2D brand design. Then they do a website. So they're mm -hmm. doing web design and then they're doing a resume, which is essentially print design. So our program is very integrated. But the people with the focus areas, it's there's no mistaking it. Someone has a, an entire portfolio of photography. They're not also trying to be a UX researcher or whatever it is, yeah, you know? Right. So that would be interesting. I, I should do some, some follow-up and see in your job, you know, let's say you got a job in your field, commercial photography, for example, say, are you required to do any, any print or any writing or any social media? Um, I'll have to see. Cause I know anecdotally, if you hire someone that's a junior, anything, and they can do more than one thing, they're immediately more valuable. Mm -hmm. Um, the question is what role are they in? Right. Because everything is sort of a full-time job. You know, you hire someone to be a packaging production artist. They don't have time to like start being a social media, you know, a copywriter as well. Like yeah, something's got to get but it. You hear about these job descriptions that are these super unicorn type positions. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I heard of someone who's looking for three roles and the, the total budget for these three roles together is like what you would pay for one VP or one upper level person. And I was like, man, good luck getting three talented people to serve these three distinct functions for the budget of like one super senior person. And, uh, so just made me, made me curious, like, are people trying to find snipers who can do the one thing and do it really well all day, every day? Or are they looking for these Swiss army knives that can come in and, and do a variety of things, whether that's like three different things or 30 different things, but like just not by definition, specialists. Yeah. Let's find so, out. <laughs> yeah. So that's another thing I'd love to hear, you know, in the comments of, of wherever you are, dear listener, hop on and give me some input on this. I'd love to, love to hear if you are, if you are hiring or your company is hiring, what are you looking for? Are you looking for specialists or gener generalists today, Absolutely. especially for those right out of school positions? Absolutely. It's, it's very curious too, because I feel like I mean, my God, we could do a whole other show on just on job hunting and the, <laughs> right. the gruesomeness of it, yeah. the sweetness and the sorrow. Um, I think that if somebody goes in too wide, it's very often they don't, the, the, pe the people reading it don't really know how to receive it. Mm -hmm. And they're like, wait, what does this guy really care about? And, or they might say, I mean, that's, that's almost like the best case scenario. You've created, an, you've, you've shown enough skill that it creates confusion. Right. The opposite is also true is that someone might say, I acknowledge that this guy has multiple skills, including, you know, branding, whatever we're looking for. But I know that I can't afford him because he has this, this multiplicity. He's really, really valuable uh, utility infielder, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of those conversations happen like f about the same person and they might even happen like on the same day. I mean, I know that when I was looking for work, um, I mean, I was looking for work for 15 years, freelancer, but <laughs> there were times where I, I would literally have two phone calls in a day. And one person would say, you're too focused on branding. And the next person would say, I don't know what you're about. I, I don't understand. You, you don't seem like a branding person. You're, you're too wide. And I'm like, mm -hmm. you're kidding me, right? Like, can you talk to the other guy? Cause he got the message. So uh, that's you always need to compare good. notes and figure this out. Yeah, no, that's, that's totally, uh, I don't know if that's common or what, but, um, you do have those, those hyper focused appetites 
Mm -hmm. You'll see someone that says, oh, well, I, I see you've got a ton of great skateboarding photography, but I'm really looking for running and hiking. And that's, that's very different. <laughs> you know, like, uh, just take away the skateboard. It kind of looks the same. And then, and, right. But then other people are like, oh, you're a copywriter and you also took a photo at your cousin's wedding. You're hired. Like, you know, they just yeah, don't right. even care what your background is. Um, I, I'm not sure I have the solution. Well, I, I think I'm maybe a really poor example to like the, the further I get into my career, the more I want to do all the things. And, yes. you know, so like I, I have a lot more commas in my LinkedIn description than I used to even the title, uh, which is kind of ridiculous. So, uh, like, I don't know what I want to do when I grow up and I can't hardly fault someone who's 22 years old for not having it figured out either. But it, I think the challenge is when you want to present yourself to the market as someone who is X or someone who is X, Y, and Z, yeah. said for our uh, international listeners, um, you know, you, yeah, get, you yeah. just got to back it up. Like your personal brand, your resume, your website, your social media profile has to echo what you're trying to get across. So like when you were talking about you're presenting yourself as a brand specialist, did you have the website to back it up? Did you have, like, I'm not questioning you. Like this is more for our, our junior listeners who are like, Hey, well, why, why, when I send out this resume, am I not getting the feedback that I want? Like maybe there's some, some dissonance there between how you present you and, and what they're seeing. Yeah, absolutely. And in our portfolio class, um, the requirement is that when they launch the site, they have to have five projects. And now that seems like pretty small. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I tell them some of them have like wide eyes. They're like five projects. I'm like, you're taking four classes right now. What did you do for three years? Pre like <laughs> dig something up. But those five projects should, should create the impression. Mm -hmm. And so if you're a photographer, for example, maybe one of the projects is print, but you're using photos in the print layout, right? 100%. And, or if it's, I don't know, maybe it's a collaborative project where your role was as the project manager. Okay, that's a little bit different. So now you're talking about your, your extension, your next set of skills, but you've got three and a half of them that really back up what you're trying to do. And so um, the real, I don't know, I think the trouble spot comes when you, if you have the proverbial five projects and they're all different, mm. one is illustration, right. one is photography, one is layout. One is website, one, yeah. and then they don't even integrate. So it's not even like a illustration that was used in a, a you know, brand marketing activation, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. It's just an illustration on a white background. It just kind of lives on its own. Um, so that's where we get trouble. So think about that. And I think that, that kind of backs up what I've heard in the industry as well, that um, like my buddy, Craig Ward, who is a great typographic illustrator, kind of fine art typography. And he's worked with, um, agents. I've never really worked artist reps and agents, you know, that, that world. Mm -hmm. Sure. More for photographers and illustrators, I think, than, than like branding folks. Although that would be nice if I just got a phone call and say, Hey, would you like this project? I'll say, yeah, sure. You could take 10%. You did the work. I mean, 100%. anyway, all day long, the, uh, how can you say this? Like the prevailing wisdom is that for, for, in order to get a rep, you only need about nine projects. Like if you're an illustrator, you have to assert your personal illustration style. Mm -hmm. It only takes like nine projects and same thing for photography. If you're an architectural photographer and, and you go through nine pages of, of different buildings you photograph, like that's enough. I got, I got the look. Yeah, I, I get can it. pitch that to an ad agency <laughs> or something. And that seems quite small, but it, it takes a while to reinforce your, your, uh, your approach or your aesthetic. Mm-hmm. Well, this, this might fly in the face of the prevailing wisdom from Ghostbusters, which is don't cross the streams. Uh, but I was talking to a friend of mine the other day about like how he decides how to mix all this stuff together. And he was talking about kind of, for him, it's always like pick three axes. So it's like, for him, it's, I think it was technology and startups and inspiration or something like that. And for him, whatever he finds that's in the intersection of those three things like works for him. So it's not about just picking, okay, I'm just about startups. Cause that's like too specific and maybe too broad at the same time. But when you add those other factors in there, then it's like, oh, well I can get the kind of business or the kind of role that you might be a good fit for because it's those three. So maybe that's another thing for our, our listeners to think about when it comes to positioning themselves for 
the kind of role they want is it's not just about branding, but it's about, you know, maybe some examples that you used before, like it's about photography and it's about skateboarding. So yeah. where, where can I work in brand photography and skateboarding all in the same role? Totally. And I think that is one of those situations, you know, one of my favorite isms and I have a lot of these, but <laughs> one of the, my favorites is you can't steer a parked car. And <laughs> basically when you're out of work, like you have to do anything possible to get into a job. Mm -hmm. And man, I love our profession, but it's a tough business. And I think there are far too many skilled practitioners across all disciplines, you right? Web design, graphic mm -hmm. design, animation, whatever, who, who are just not working. Or if they're freelancing, they're extremely struggling, very inconsistent. Um, so once you get into a role that, that broadly speaking works, it allows you the dignity of shoes that don't have holes in them and a clothes mm -hmm. that fit, you know, then you can start to, to niche down or to refine or to really focus. And yes, eventually you can, you can uh, have those focus areas. that are not just one, not just specializing brand identity, specialize in brand identity for startups and eventually add four B2B, you know, accounting technology yeah. or whatever it is like. Hopefully you can find your place, but I'm telling you, that's like a luxury to start adding modifiers and saying no to potential projects. Well, hey, maybe coming back to you a little bit specifically, um, are you encouraged in your current role to like stay in industry to do projects, to do freelance, to have like personal pursuits or to publish things? Like what, what does that look like? Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, hello, Dr. McKenna. I know you're listening. But <laughs> <laughs> Funny enough, my current role is a lecturer. That's the rank, mm -hmm. which is like the lowest teacher role. Um, I guess there's like instructor or lab assistant, but a lecturer is a full-time position, but it's not tenure track. So I'm not expected to do research or to publish, you know, capital S scholarly material. Mm -hmm. Um and also, I mean, as often happens in the fine arts and in, in the performing arts, there's no practice associated with my role. So I don't have to do gallery shows. I don't have to maintain a studio. Um, you know, officially, my role is to teach the material. So officially, no one cares whether or not I'm good or if I keep my skills up. Mm -hmm. Unofficially, of course, I think it's an absolute necessity. I think it would be a dereliction of duty to not stay involved in, in the industry. And I've become pretty involved in AIGA Arizona. You know, it's a great squad out here. Mm, um, that's totally awesome. different than New York city. I think the local, and I've heard this as well, that the local AIGA chapters is, is a, almost a completely different experience than the, than, than New York, frankly, I don't know what Los Angeles mm. and Chicago, other, other big regions. Um, but the local ones, you know, your Kansas city and your Seattle and you know, whatever it is. And and yeah, I try to stay up on it. I mean, the job is really demanding and it's kind of like seven jobs. You know what I'm saying? So on oh, any sure. given day, I'm like a blogger, a researcher, an improv actor, an accounting <laughs> clerk. Like, there's so many different things. And that, that's part of the exhaustion. Um, and I, I hold myself to a high standard, right? So this summer I edited uh, Zoom for Dummies. I was, I was part of that team. Oh, nice. And another ASU instructor, a lecturer was the, was the author. So we teamed up on that and that's, that's out now. Um, so, you know, editing books and speaking at conferences, even, even if they're virtual, like I'm, I'm going to speak at creative mornings, Phoenix, which is coming up in October and that's, it's virtual, but that's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. And that's awesome. I've done like, yeah, you know, I've done some other ones. I, I did a conference for Slack this summer. And so I, I gave my spiel about Slack for education. Mm -hmm. Um, so doing things like that, it goes into my CV. Absolutely. Officially speaking, it's not part of my job, which is a little curious, you know? Hmm. Interesting. Well, I know we went into this talk with like big plans of like, hey, once we get done with the education topic, we will segue into talking about architecture and what it's like living in Arizona. And like, we've not gotten to that at all. And we're, we're running out of time quickly. So before yeah. I let you go. I want to at least ask you the question that I always have to ask everybody on the show. And I've asked you either two or three times. We'll have to actually go back to the archives and confirm how many shows you've been on. Listeners will have all of those past episodes, which will probably be very different conversations in the show notes uh, of this episode as well. But the question is, 
Prescott, what do you find that you are most obsessed with right now? Uh, this is going to be a funny answer. I think I'm obsessed with time travel. And, <laughs> <laughs> Which has come up a couple of times in this episode yeah. already. So here's the, here's the odd thing, right? I'm, I'm now in a university setting. I'm mixing with people who are 18, 19, 20, 22 years old, but I also have some mature students. You know, I have people coming back for their second degree. I have people coming out of the military. And so they're almost closer to my age. You know, I'm 39. So in some cases, I'm literally double their age, mm -hmm. the students. But in some cases, um, they might only be three or four years younger than me or whatever. And so I'm constantly having to do this, what I call time travel empathy, where you think about how, what I felt at that age and whether or not this person feels differently. And is that because I'm treating them gruesomely? Or is it just a different situation? And you, you know, you sort of have to project your former and current and future self into that same situation. It's very odd. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, part of the job is time travel that we have to say, are we preparing these people not for tomorrow, but for four years from now? Mm -hmm. And some of the conversations we have are actually in this kind of six or seven year time frame. Like we're, I think we're actually working with Adobe to, to imagine the curriculum of the next 10 years and not just at, at ASU, but in general, and it's like, what are designers going to need to learn? And I, of course I'm a bit of a stalwart. I'm like, uh, they need to know Aristotle and Plato. Like, well, that's <laughs> the basics never change calculus. Right. But then at the same time, I'm also thinking ahead and right. I have nephews. The oldest one is four. So it's like, oh my God, mm -hmm. what, what is the university landscape going to be in another 14 years when he's a freshman at, or, and can I stay in this job for 14 years? You know, that's, that's a question. Like some folks, um, I mean, people stay in universities for a long time. They'll do their whole career in one, one place. And there are professors who, have, who did their PhD there and they've already been there for 30 years. You know, they've, they've sort right. of been at that campus since they were 18 and now they're 63 or whatever it is. And it's like, oh, geez, do I have that option? Is that even a possibility? Mm. So there's time travel going in a lot of different ways. Yeah, it's interesting, especially on the university level, that um, there's there's a little bit more of that tradition of the one job and staying there forever, where like yeah. in almost every other industry, that's out the window at this point. But yeah, totally. Um, it's interesting that that can still still be very true at the university level. Yeah. Oh man, this we could be talking about this for days. That like higher ed <laughs> is so bizarre, and frankly, I'll, maybe I'll leave you with this just to keep the door open. In three years, in two and a half years, whatever, the only thing I've learned for certain is that I don't think design belongs in a big public state university system. Mm. And even things like semesters, which you don't really question, they're, they're so entrenched, that shit does not really work for different fields. And when you have a, a career-focused track like web design or you know architecture, whatever it is, you have to challenge every convention, but certain institutions are not really up for flexibility. Mm -hmm. So even the idea you say, why are the, why are the semesters 15 weeks? They're like, well, cause they've always been 15, you know, they have this yeah, non answer right. for you. So that's the only thing I'm sure of. So if anyone has $5 million to burn, I'll tell you about my idea for a, a new type of school. <laughs> well, that's a good segue. So before we let you go, uh, that listener with $5 million to burn and who's really interested in fixing design education, how can our listeners find you on the interwebs and connect with you after the show? Sure. Well, my site is perezfox.com. And I would say the best way to get in touch with me is through social media, uh, Scott Perez Fox on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and you can find me, I mean, perezfox.com has all my email and stuff. And then if you want to learn about the ASU situation, our program is called Graphic Information Technology, which is GIT. And we have a lot of social media, but they're all like different. So it doesn't really lend itself to quickly saying. Um, but just look at, look at my site and you can find the links there. Sweet. Well, Prescott, it was great catching up with you. We will have to, as we talked before we hit record, like you and I need to connect more than just every couple of years to be on the podcast. But it was good catching up with you, man. Good to see you. Absolutely. All right. Well, cheers. Yeah. Thanks for being on the show and thanks for being obsessed with design. Okay, kids, that's episode number 154 in the books. 
For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.